Well, hello everyone and welcome to Insight with Political Tours and Beyond the Headlines. Our discussion today is about something that has affected us all over the past few months, living in lockdown or living in isolation. We're very lucky to have two guests with us who are both uniquely qualified to talk about the subject. They are John McCarthy, the journalist and broadcaster, who was taken hostage in Lebanon in 1986 and spent over five years in captivity. Hello, John. Where are you joining us from? Hello, Nick. Uh, very nice to be with you uh, on this webinar. Thanks for having me. I'm in Teddington in West London, where the skies are incredibly grey today, but they have been very blue and much clearer because Heathrow Airport, which is near, very nearby, is having about three planes a day rather than 3,000. So, so it's been a different, different place during this, this, this period of lockdown. OK, excellent. Good, good to have you with us. Thank you very much. We're also joined by Judith Moring, a consultant psychiatrist who specialises in rehabilitation. Hello, Judith, where are you joining us from? Hello, Nick, hello, John, hello, everyone. I'm joining um, from Blackheath in South East London, and it's a real joy to be here. It is a rainy day in Blackheath as well, um, and I'm delighted that the children are not in the house. So hopefully the study door will not open and I won't be in demand. So uh, it's a pleasure to have an undisturbed hour. Fantastic. Well, we're, I'm speaking to you from the Welsh um, Shropshire border and it's um, uh, grey and raining here, which is um, not very different to a normal day. Um, if you've got any questions as we go along, please put them in the Q&A box at the bottom. And of course, please do stay online at the end of the hour for our discussion when we can just chat among ourselves. John, I'm going to start with you, um, first of all. I've been rereading some of the accounts of your time in activity. And when I first heard about the comparisons between what we're going through and your ordeal, I thought, I mean, how on earth can you compare the two? I mean, it just seemed to be so two completely different things. But we've spoken recently, and I know that as you've been going through this current process, you've been thinking a lot and, and going back um, to what happened to you. And there, and there are some comparisons to be made, if I'm right. No, definitely right, Nick. Um, yes, on one level, it's obviously not being locked up in my, so to speak, locked down rather in uh, in, in my apartment here in West London is is, is nothing like being locked locked up and chained up underground back in as those days in Lebanon. But I think that it does stir up memories. But also, there are clear parallels. Of the, the, the thought of all the uncertainty that well, the whole world is facing, but we are all facing uh, wherever we are, not, not quite knowing. You know, even things like is it two meters or one meter? And that probably presumably depends on which country you're living in, let alone whether we're just one, w w waiting here in the UK for Prime Minister Boris Johnson to make up his mind. Oh, but all, all that stuff, and then how long will it take uh, till, till we can come out of lockdown? And, and, and when will schools be able to open? When will it be safe to send children back to school? So all, the, all that level of uncertainty is something that I absolutely remember. But clearly, I mean, back in those days, the uncertainty extended not just to sort of what will happen next month or next week but literally just not just tomorrow even but actually you know minute by minute we simply did not know what was going to happen and at any minute um it, there wasn't going to be just like oh, you can you know you can go out and exercise more or go to the park or meet some friends or maybe meet your family for the first time in a couple of months as we we're all hoping at the moment you know but it would be could we be going home forever to back to regain our lives or just moving to another place or or of course and I guess this echoes the same thing, the idea that you know, at any point they might come in and shoot us, um, well, the, the guards have the people holding us. And so that, that, that could have happened. But then there's that, that, that threat that we're all living under now, you know, that we, we don't know if we're going to catch something, whether and it might affect the older generations, more people like me and a bit older, or the kids. We, you know, we don't know. So there's, there is that element of extraordinary a sense of risk, I suppose, and not knowing. And, uh, and that, is, that, I, that, I think, is, is, is probably the strongest echo that I feel sort of day in, day out, really. Um, we, we were speaking earlier in the week, and um, one of the things that um, was brought home to me is that, I mean, your, our levels of anxiety have, have, you know, clearly gone up. I actually got really annoyed with somebody who came round to have a distance drinks in the garden, and he said, Oh, lockdown has been marvellous and it's been absolutely wonderful. And I've been able to get on with my writing. And uh, and I felt like, you know, I, I thought, well, for some people it's, it hasn't. It's, it could be a very stressful process. Um, it, you, you, thinking back to that, that time period, um, I remember you thinking about your A-level exams in the middle of, you know, being locked up 
in a cell somewhere. Yeah, yeah. And the sniper. But that's true. And I, well, I think that's true. But I think also just what your your point about being annoyed with somebody who comes around for a drink and saying marvelous, marvelous. You know, get, I think that the lack of empathy and the lack of realizing that we need to use perspective to, to, to decide. Yes, I mean, I've been lucky living here. I, I can go out and about. I haven't got any particular money worries. I've had, been able to work a bit from home. Whereas a lot of people, their lives are completely on hold at the moment. That must be absolutely desperate whether they can provide for their families and such like. But yes, when I was first banged up, it's interesting how we do react. Yes, I've been thinking back to my, my experience as a hostage un, under the present COVID-19 lockdown, but I remember when I was first taken, and I was, uh, this is the spring of, uh, of 1986, and I was initially held underground, in an underground uh, some kind of prison, various other prisoners there, and uh, locked up um, in, in a tiny little solitary cell. Uh, and obviously very frightened, very anxious. I mean, optimism seemed to kick in, so I kept thinking, they must have made a mistake. And I was a completely unknown journalist of no value. I, I would have thought to anybody, they'll let me go in a few days. But, you know, days, days turned to months. And it was weird that just actually again, like now, I was slept, and understandably, certainly then, I slept very badly. and be waking up, you know, uh, often covered in sweat. It was very hot, but also just out of nervous tension, I think. Uh, and one, what I remember one day waking up in this little tiny cell, on a very thin mattress, um, absolutely shaking with fear and sweating. And I, I woke up saying to myself, oh my God, I've got to take my A-levels again. And then sort of sat back down, laid back down on this bed and thought, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, you haven't got to take your A-levels again. It was like madness. I was going and thinking, no, you've got some O-levels, GCSEs as, as they were in those A-levels. You even managed to get a fairly bad degree from university so you, you know you've got through all that you don't have what the problem is john is not a levels you've been kidnapped by a terrorist gang and you're being held right Whew. so that was brilliant so i got i got over it it, it was therapy it was brilliant therapy judith you must use this sort of aversion therapy that i got i got i got over the a level nightmare but sorry this is just a, 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 an afterthought <laughs> maybe it's, it's just the effects of the british education system that years later back home, safe back in London, uh, after, after the, you know, the captive experience was all over and I'd been released and safely back home and getting on with life. I, rem I woke up one morning in the cold sweat and it wasn't with the you know, post-traumatic flashback to being locked up again in a cell. I woke up again and I was thinking, oh my God, I've got to reset my A-levels. So somehow the British education system must be, have a power, more powerful effect than, than, effect than, than <laughs> being kidnapped in, in far away places. Madness, but anyway, there we go. One of the other things that struck me is you, you talked about forced isolation, but you also had forced companionship. So some of us are living um, by ourselves, but there are many, very many people who are locked up with their loved ones. And, and they've, you know, they, they clearly made those commitments um, a long time ago. Um, but you don't have any opportunity to get away from each other as well. So forced companionship, I thought, was another thing because you, you had an incredibly re close relationship um, with your fellow captives, particularly with Brian Keenan. And, and, and that must be something sort of difficult to, to handle. Do you, do you live alone now? Do you, um, how do you find other people's company? Uh, I, I do live alone most of the time. I, I'm married but separated. My wife lives very nearby and we have a 14-year-old daughter, Lydia, who moves between us. So she was with me for two weeks and then back to Anna's, my wife, for two weeks. And that, work, that works very well. Um, I, I'm, I'm quite happy being on my own, uh, but I do enjoy company. And I, I don't think, unless it, one was in a small place, luckily I've, you know, when we were all together, we were in a, in a reasonable sized house, you know, the, the sense of space was, was great and we had a garden and such like. And here in my, my flat, my apartment, I, I feel comfortable. But I think you're right that for many people um, at this time, when, when you simply cannot go out at all, and in some places, I, know I was talking to some folk in India who were absolutely stuck in their apartment with quite a large family and they weren't even allowed to go out for a walk you know one person could go out to get to get food supplies etc i think suddenly is you know that that sense of being forced to stay put and try and keep calm and particularly if you're maybe having to work from home and you've got little kids who obviously need lots of attention too that that would be very difficult um, but i think i mean i was very 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 fortunate as, as you mentioned i became extremely close and, and still am with brian keenan the irish guy from 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 belfast who who I was with solidly 24-7 for four years and with uh, uh, three, um, but particularly two of the American hostages who were also with us for a long time and, and Terry Waite, another Englishman. And, um, and I, I was just so lucky because I know that others uh, held Western hostages held in Lebanon at that point, let alone obviously people in other places, um, could not get on. And um, I heard a poignant story that one of the Americans sort of 
said to the guards, you know, either you put me alone away from whoever he was currently sharing a cell with, or, you know, I'd rather you shoot me. And that, I mean, God knows you think you're desperate for company in, in solitary, and one is uh, most of the time, uh, but then to be, to be, to be with someone who w would, would drive you to the point of rather being dead than, than, than staying with him was sort of unimaginable. I think the other person, you know, had, had big problems, but there we go. But I was so lucky because Brian and I, totally different backgrounds. He was from Belfast, um, a working class background. He'd grown up in the Troubles. I was, you know, rather posh sounding, uh, middle England, middle class public school boy. Um, very, very different backgrounds. And I think had we met before uh, captivity, um, well, but sort of, I don't know, in a bar in Beirut or whatever before we got kidnapped, then I think we probably wouldn't, wouldn't have taken to each other at all. But obviously, as you said, it was forced, forced uh, sharing of a cell in, in, inside. And gradually, well, I think we soon realised that we, we, we found each other amusing, we could make each other laugh. And the, the ability to laugh under, you know, those terrifying circumstances, that, that empathy, that warmth was, was really, really important all the way through the captivity with, with Brian and with the other guys too, the other hostages too. Um, but then I think we sort of recognised that the differences between us were actually sort of part of part of the, of the limited resources that we had, well, almost negligible resources that we had in those sort of very boring, isolated little cells. So, so we drew a lot from each other and 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 shared our our lives, even the people we knew, to to create a sense of community and future together. So, so we were very lucky, um, and you know, and became very close. And that was, you know, we luckily, even though I mean, there were times. I do remember on one occasion, you know. Little tiny cell, which is just room for two little foam rubber mattresses. So probably, you know, six foot by six foot mattresses on the floor. I expect we were chained up by then already, and you know, in this dark and underground cell. And I remember doing that sort of classic, <laughs> petulant thing of saying, "Look, Brian, there is a line down the middle of this room, and you know, it goes right around there, and you stay on your side, and I'll stay on my side." And he just looked at me, you know, nodding because he obviously realised I was sort of stressed or <laughs> wound up. And, all right, fellow. All right, all right, all right, all right. And then. Two minutes later, he couldn't stop giggling, you know, and then five minutes later, we were both roaring with laughter because I had obviously been a complete eejit, as Brian would put it. But but it was difficult, but it was, we were so lucky. We were so lucky to, to have each other and also to accept each other. Um, never We never tried to, certainly Brian and I didn't, I think it was slightly different with some of the American hostages. We, we often obviously had discussions and debates about all manner of things. Uh, and would sort of argue our our, cor our corner, if you like. But I don't think, certainly for Brian and I, we weren't, didn't want to win. It wasn't the point that we wanted to prove the other guy wrong or say, ah, oh, yeah, John knows more than Brian. It wasn't like that. It was more about finding out from each other and intrigued as to why the other guy you know, disagreed. What, 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 what's that about? Why, where does that come from? And, and, and some of it we put down to our different backgrounds, and then sometimes we... We'd agree on something that perhaps we thought, oh, I wouldn't have thought we'd have the shared an opinion on that, but we did. So that was that was that was all interesting. And it meant because there was pressure. Well, obviously we couldn't go outside at all. We had no communication whatsoever with the outside world. So it was just the two of us. So we had to kind of kind of create uh, a, a, well an atmosphere, but a future a sort of ideas, plans projects that we might do once we got out and things. And also, you know, to try and expand the horizons, just thinking of us all being under lockdown wherever we are in the world really mostly still i think um you know the idea that we're in these little rooms that maybe maximum you know with, with 10 feet by 10 feet just you know um and gray concrete cell cell walls you know that we would sort of describe places we've been to you know beautiful places now we, we first met nick in, in kosovo and i would you know now if i was back that with brian i would be saying oh, i went to this amazing place and met this guy nick who ran these you know whatever whatever it was and talked about the river that bridge at, um must must yeah. yeah. uh, and there and, and and talk and describe that scene so that we're then talking about the mountains of Kosovo or Switzerland or wherever it might be to paint if you like pictures on the walls to, to, to give ourselves horizons beyond beyond that blank concrete that was so close and so oppressive so I mean that was, that was sort of how we were lucky that we had that that we weren't just sort of staring at each other in some kind of loathing we we were working for each other and 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 taking from each other very very you know, definitely yeah yeah well it, it's fascinating and gripping um to listen to you talking about it um i know everyone's gonna have lots of questions so please everyone do put your questions in the q a bubble just below here um judith you've been listening in and i know you're going to react to some of the things that john has been talking about but this is your job you listen to people going through this process uh and so from a professional perspective you you were able to draw some judgments about 
what we've been, been going through. And, and I think there are several, you've sort of, um, it sounds like a cliche, but you've analyzed several stages to us in lockdown. And I, I'd be very grateful if you could just start with um, the first of those stages, Judith. Well, thank you. Thank you, Nick. And I think, John, it was so interesting to hear what you were saying about bringing your past into your cell that you were recreating with Brian memories of the past and the beautiful places you've been to because I think it just speaks to the power of the mind and what I've experienced in this whole episode has been how powerful the mind can be both for good or for ill and what happened to start with I noticed Nick with you know financial markets and also all my clients who I zoom in on and me we all panicked Everybody panicked in March. Uh, governments panicked. Uh, everybody just had this pandemic of panic. And what loo I really rolls. loo rolls. That's my abiding memory. Walking down the shopping aisle and not seeing any loo rolls. <laughs> no loo rolls. Exactly. No loo rolls. And uh, people um, panicked buying hummus as if they were waiting for some, you know, terminal dinner party where they'd have to have dips and crackers. And, and these crazy things. Um, but it, of course, fear is so contagious because we communicate our emotions non-verbally, just through our eye contact. And fear is known as the quick and dirty emotional response. So it's, there was this pandemic of panic around the globe. The internet was spreading it like bilio. The news is spreading it like bilio. And we all got a dose, even if we have hopefully been untouched by coronavirus, we've all had a real dose of panic. And we, yeah, we know, I mean, one of the things you were talking about, John, was uncertainty. We know that there are certain things that humans find particularly stressful, and we talk about stress being nuts. So anything that's new, so novelty is really stressful, uncertainty is really stressful, a threat to the ego is really stressful, where you think, hang on a minute, what's, what am I supposed to be doing? What's the new normal? That's stressful. And then the final thing is this loss of control. If you've got a sense of loss of control, and unfortunately, coronavirus has given us all of those things. It's given us this nuts analogy of stress, novelty, uncertainty, threat to ego, loss of control in space. And that has been a real learning point for me, is just walking through that, that process with all of my clients, just walking through those things and saying, well, how can you get a little bit of certainty back, a little bit of control back, a little bit of knowing what to do back? Because none of us know what we're doing anymore. And it's been... It's been really, really interesting and a huge privilege to zoom in and support people through this, but it's really been, it's been like a learning program and what happens when everybody panics all at once. Yeah. So, so just say this, so it's novelty, uncertainty, and what was the T in the S? The th uh, T is threat to the ego. So that's the right. threat to the ego piece was, do you remember when nobody wanted to do the fist bump? Yeah. Or the elbow bump or the fist bump, and we were all thinking we look silly if we have to put a face mask on. Yeah. Uh, and that's threat to the ego. It's like, this is all new, this is all uncertain. I think I'm going to look really silly, so I'm not going to do this. And the final piece is the sense of control. And you were referencing the Stanford prisoner experiment earlier. Well, there's, there's some really good psychological experiments about locus of control. And this is what I come back to again and again with my clients is don't worry about what Donald Trump's doing because you're not in charge of that. Worry about what you're doing what you're doing now in this space in your even if it's you know what you're going to have for lunch just bring it back to what's under your control and if you can control that piece then you'll panic less about all the other stuff that's really frustrating and stressful but just bring it back to this piece here so in bringing the sense of control back into, into your arena I, i'm going to come back to you in a second judith about um the sort of the next phase is is um you know what do we do next maybe uh lockdown is easing in some places um and, and there's an expectation that life might turn back to normality um so i want to come to you in a second but john i want to take you back again when you were released from captivity uh, and obviously enormously elated how long did it take you to get um, to regain some sense of control, regain some idea of normality? That must have been a very long process for you. It's a really interesting point. Just before you asked that very good question, I was listening to, to what Judith was saying about that loss of control, or sense of control going. And it was making me think, God, you know, that was, it was weirdly, although it was terrifying, not knowing what was happening, as I said, even minute by minute when we were banged up in Beirut, but uh, we didn't have to make any decisions about anything, which was horrible on one level, but you did get used to that for five and a quarter years. 
it wasn't up to me, you know, uh, unless the only thing I could decide to do was, which we occasionally did for a few days, go on hunger strike, you know, to say I'm withdrawing. And that was, that was as, far, as far as it could go, which is awful. But coming out, yes, suddenly there, there one, the whole world, you know, was, you could do whatever you liked again, theoretically. And I, I remember even, even the first night back in the UK, I was released in Beirut, obviously, and then taken by the Syrian intelligence people to, to Damascus, where I met up with my dad and brother, and we fl flew home to um, an RAF base in Wiltshire. And we, my dad and brother and I stayed there for a few days while I was debriefed by RAF psychiatrists, which was, which was brilliant. It was a sort of safe, obviously, very, very, very secure environment in an air base. Um, but I remember that very first night, uh, we were in this kind of little VIP suite in, 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 that they'd given us, which was brilliant. And there were um, a couple of women there who, who were looking after us, you know, doing the, doing the cooking, I suppose, and stuff. And, and uh, one of them came through and said, John, well, what do you want, what do you want to eat? And, um, and I thought, oh, I don't know. And I turned to my dad and said, well, Dad, you, don't, you, you, you decide. I, I can't think. And he looked and said, you've got to decide, John. You, know, you can decide again now. And I turned to my brother and said, no. You know, and, oh, God. and I, it was, but it was quite strange that suddenly, so I think I went for, for lamb chops, bizarrely. But anyway, that was it. But it, it took, I think, I think it did take a while to get used to being, to being back in control. Um, I think that the most, somehow it, it was, it was okay because I was very, very well looked after. But I remember that, and after a couple of weeks at this RAF base, or maybe ten days, I don't know. I then went with my dad and brother. We stayed somewhere else, and then I went on holiday with my fiance, Jill Morell, who'd been running the campaign for the British hostages. And we and another mate went off. And I remember we were we were we went to Wales. We borrowed a friend's cottage in Wales, whether it's near you or Nick, Nick I don't know. But anyway, further into Wales, I think. And um, and I was driving for the first and for the first time in five years. I had a little girl on the airbase, but this was now driving down the motorway. And I remember I was trying to work out my brain had lost, because I'd been locked up in tiny rooms for so long, lost the real sense of perspective. Uh, we were, I was talking about emotional perspective earlier, but this, this was physical perspective. So it was that weird thing that I'd be looking, you know, you look at a mountainside, you look up at a mountain and, you know, obviously your brain and life and tells you that that big house here is close by, that little cottage up there is, is a long way off and it is... It only looks smaller. In fact, when you get there, it's quite a big building. And likewise, there aren't miniature cars halfway up the mountain and big ones down here, you know. And I was, I was trying to get in, get in my head around this because it was, it was just so weird to me. I, I'd lost that sense of literal perspective. And I remember driving along and I was saying to, to, to Jill and our friend Chris, who was with us, as I was driving along down the M4 or whatever it was, you know, I presume it was 70 or eight, I don't know, whatever miles an hour, and looking through the rear view mirror, I was thinking, isn't it interesting? You know, that you get a completely different sense of scale and stuff as you're, as you're looking through the rear view mirror. And they both shout at me and say, for God's sake, don't worry about that. Or just look where you're going. But that was all. And it was very gentle. It was very gentle, actually, because people were so loving. And even people like, you know, strangers I met were, were, were loving and caring. That it, it was a gentle approach back in. And I wasn't suddenly thrown back in, as many people would be, say, coming out now out of, out of the lockdown here into the frantic business of, of having to earn a living again, of worrying about the people around you. I was self-conscious because I was at that point very, very famous. And for, for no, you know, no reason, that, well, no good reason really, you know, that I could understand, but everybody knew who I was because of, of being in the news. And um, so, but it was, it was scary. But I didn't, I wasn't, didn't have the pressure uh, of money, etc. I'd, I'd been paid while I was banged up anyway by my company. So all, all that sort of stuff. And, and my dad and brother and everybody was so loving that it was, it was a kind of gradual process. Uh, but I think it took years, probably. I, in fact, I just remember thinking of, of Keenan, Brown Keenan, um, whether this make make sense to, to Judith. I didn't know, but I was over in, in Dublin seeing Brown and his wife a, a long time after, after our release. Brown came home a year before me. And, uh, and he was, we were chatting, we were doing it as, as ever, of course. And he suddenly said, how are you? And I said, well, I'm, I'm fine. And he said, yeah, I know, but how are you really, John? And I said, well, I really am fine, Brian. I think, I mean, I seriously think I'm, I am really good now. And he said, yes. He said, I think you are. You know, obviously I've been watching you the couple of days you've been staying with us. And, you know, I know you very well, clearly. But, you know, I can see that there's something, some calmness about you. And he said, it's interesting. He said, it's probably one of my mad theories. Uh, but he said, you know, last year I suddenly felt that there was this weight had gone. And he said, I don't think anything in particular had happened, but he said it was, I suddenly realised, he said, Brian, it was four years after I'd come home and I was banged up, locked up for four years. He said, I realise now a year on, you're, you seem to have that same 
freedom about you that I felt then and still have. And I realised, he said, you were banged up for five years, you've been home for five years. He said, it's probably nonsensical, you know, science or, 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 or psychiatry. He said, but that's interesting that even though we've both been lucky enough to live lives, write books, do all sorts of interesting things, since we got out and, you know, um, yeah, we, I think we were both, Brown certainly married at that point. I think I was getting married, not, not, not to, to Jill, but to my, my wife, Anna. You know, that we've moved on and done all that stuff. But however, it, that has, so we've had a lot of benefits and, and good stuff happening to us, but it's taken that time to actually sort of, for that, for that shadow perhaps, to, or those clouds to finally drift away. I don't, I don't know if that's nonsense. But it, so it was a while, but of course we had a lot of advantages in, in the yeah. meantime. I, I, John was talking about... Um something you just um, picked up on what we we had a discussion briefly last week and you talked about uh, how people's brains actually do change in isolation and that lack of mm. social contact. Um, so perhaps you could just talk a bit about that because whilst obviously we're not in captivity, the lack of social contact does have an impact. It has a huge impact, yes. I mean, it's really interesting, John, hearing what you were saying about the loss of depth perception because I've said to a lot of my clients who are terrified about going outdoors at the moment that we need to be outdoors. We need to be outdoors for our physical health, for our lung function, for our muscle function, so that if we do get COVID, we are still in good condition. But we also need to be outdoors so that we look at a distance, because they know, for instance, in China, from school children who spend a lot of time on screens, they end up short-sighted. So we genuinely need to be outdoors to exercise our eyes and our brain. And interestingly, the European Space Agency has a, a, space, a base in Antarctica called the Concordia. And at Concordia, one of the things they do is they lock people down through an Antarctic winter as training for the space station. And um, this is all about what you were saying about people not getting on in isolation. So what happens in isolation is you see whether people will work in space. Will they drive each other mad? Will they want to shoot each other? Or will they, you know, make, make lasagna and get on? So they do this and they're there for about four or five months. And they've noticed that people's, when you scan people's brains after four or five months in that kind of very extreme isolation, their white matter actually shrinks. So the brain shrinks, which is kind of scary when you think we've put the whole of society around the world into this vast, untried social experiment saying everybody indoors, threat of a pandemic, genuinely scary, you might die, it's random. We have, we're hardwired to be afraid of illness. So you put everybody indoors, you reduce their social contacts, and we use our social contacts, we use our mirror neurons to regulate our emotions. So when I'm with my clients, I'll look at them and I'll have facial, con you know, eye contact. And we use our mirror neurons to check that everything's okay with the world. So with a child, your body language, the whole thing reassures that child, reassures that person that you're okay. And we're missing out on so much nonverbal communication because Zoom's okay and this sort of thing is okay and the phone's okay, but we're missing out on so much of that reassurance that all's right with the world. So I've been talking as we're talking about sort of trying to emerge into whatever this new normal is. It's all about just beginning to emerge, beginning to make contact with the man at the bottom of the road who sells you milk, with the person you buy bread from, with your neighbor, the smiles, the small hello. It all reassures you that the world is okay, that actually it's safe to go out and it's safe to be out and about and it's good for us cognitively as well as physically. So there's just so much about lockdown that you know it seems crass to compare it to being held hostage and in some ways it is crass to compare it but it, it's on such a big scale and at such a sort of panicky start and for all of us to go through it um i think it'd be very interesting to see what emerges actually the other side in terms of where we all end up mm. at the end of all this <clears throat> well i'd love to get your comments everyone um i'm especially interested in in those of you listening in who think this is a whole bunch of nonsense and that we just need to pull up our socks and get on with our lives and really the pandemic is an opportunity for all of us and we just need to grab it. So um, if, if you've got those comments, please do let us know and I'll let you have your turn and, and chip in. Um, Judith, it, w that sense of uncertainty continues, doesn't it? As we um, head out, the economy has got a massive shock. Our, our, we can't expect our lives to be entirely the same, can we? Not remotely, no. What I'm finding with my clients is that my clients are in really different places with all of this. So I've been, you know, I've been saying to people all the way through, um, I'm lucky enough to be able to carry on my work at home, which is fabulous. I'm so lucky. 
Um, although at times if I'm with someone who's very distressed, it's also quite tricky to feel that you're providing them with comfort through the computer. It's very odd. I sometimes wish I could pass the tissues through, but you can't and you can't, you can't give them that physical comfort. But um, so people are in very different places. Obviously, people are in different places economically. People are in different places with respect to their health. For many people, this has reminded them of times they've had pneumonia or health scares they've had. Health anxiety is common anyway, so there's lots of kind of ghosts coming up for people, things from the past. And then what we're finding, even with simple things like, you know, we've got small children and you try and arrange a play date and say, well, we can meet in the garden, we can stay at a distance. But every new social, it's like every new friendship has to be re-established in a new social contract. How do we now relate to each other? Given, Are you happy for the children to come in the house to use the loo? Mm. Uh, do I need to bleach the loo? Can I offer them a drink? What if it's pouring with rain? So even really simple things with close friends, you're having to just establish, are we both on the same page here? And then obviously there are people who are like, oh, COVID is no threat. Or they'll be like, oh no, my children aren't leaving the house. And so people are just, there is no new normal. There was no new normal in the past, but we didn't expect there to be. We just all went around with our assumptions unchecked. And now everybody's having to check their assumptions and go, hang on, what can I assume? Is it okay for you? Where, what's your view on face masks? What do you think about this? You know, it's just really hmm. so much minor social negotiation and this tiredness as well as the other things that there was massive tiredness at the, at the onset of the pandemic because we were all so stressed and we weren't sleeping and then we were exhausted once we realized we were safe. And now the other end, I found, I went to work in, in um, London went into London on Tuesday, got on the train, had my face mask on, had my hand gel, all fine, all very civilised, all the social distancing was being followed, went to my office, saw all my patients on Zoom, because I'm not allowed to see people face to face at the moment without a mask on, and I can't do therapy with a mask on, went home, and I was absolutely exhausted, just from the the whole kind of unexpected, you know, I'm not used to getting out the house and walking 10,000 steps and seeing other people. So it's, I think it's going to be a really slow emergence phase. As you were saying, John, there's lots of things that you don't even think about that you're suddenly going, Oh, that's different. I wasn't expecting that. Um, so yeah, lots of, lots of new normal to get used to. John, one thing also, I, I was just thinking about it when you said that the early, early stages of, 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 of pandemic lockdown for all of us and that, that whether it was panic buying or whatever or suddenly being locked up at home trying to just get come to terms with it I, I, I there was something I noticed about from the hostage situation I think that weirdly some people who were held for less time maybe a year or so and then released I think there's a couple of American hostages that I was aware of really took a long time to get over it I mean they had serious you know, problems it seemed after the event uh, even though they'd gone home at, you know, and you might think, well, if you were banged up for a year, surely that can't have been as bad as, as five years. And on one level, perhaps it wasn't. But I think that those of us who were there, most of us who were there longest, luckily, somehow adapted. We didn't become sort of happy little little hostages, but we, we sort of adapted and grew to cope with the situation. Somehow, uh, to some level, uh, came to terms with the un that uncertainty because we had to live with it, even if you constantly sort of feeling like you were, you were locked down, but at the same time on a, 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 a panic level, sometimes of, of sort of adrenaline rush, you did become used to it. And I just wondered whether, I mean, some of us, obviously, as you, you were rightly pointing out, we can work from home, whatever, we, we, we can go out and about and perhaps don't have too, too many wor money worries. That many, many of us will, will sort of adjust or have been adjusting to this. But I think when we come out, I, I, I'm interested if you've been on the train. So I, I, on my phone the other day, I switched on the app, the rail app by mistake. I thought normally I'd be doing that every day, checking the next train to Teddington to Waterloo. And then I was always thinking, can I nip down to the station and get hop on a train and see how far can I get, you know, r running for freedom. But uh, but all those things will, will, will take um, time. And I think probably um, whether or not Boris would want us to be still alert, I don't know, with his great thing a couple of weeks back, but I think I remember being sort of on a complete high alert when I came home. I think we spent years listening half an ear always for what was going on down the corridor in the prison cells, whether we were going to be moved, whether something was going to happen. And I remember when I came home, even sort of going into a busy pub uh, with some friends, and that would be lovely, and then but trying to listen to sort of every conversation, just thinking I've got to follow everything that's going on. And I'm not consciously doing that, but it was just happening. And gradually that that that, that is the way. But I think it's maybe, you know, it was obviously an aftermath thing that and perhaps we'll, we'll have it a bit now, that we will be sort of hyper alert, thinking oh, I've got to keep away from people 
Why are they coming close? Who are they? What's going on here? Which is, as you say, a whole lot more exhausting than just going to the office for what would you be a very, very tiring emotional and, and uh, intellectual day anyway with your work. But on top of that, as you say, you, just getting on the train is is a kind of a high 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 pitched adventure. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just struck just looking at, um, we watch a film and you see, hang on a second, they're very close to each other, aren't they? Uh, <laughs> you thinking it's wrong, it's right. Um, we got some very good questions coming up, so I want to take some of them. And um, Isabel, if we could bring up, um, first of all, Paul Davis, just in the order that they're being asked. So Paul Davis first. Paul Davis is very interesting. Um, Paul um, was one of our the earlier speakers in this series. Um, and work with the Orem Foundation, who's the uh, director of it or chief executive of it. And they work with um, uh, HIV and TB um, in South Africa, but also he'd worked a lot with um, victims of apartheid of the regime. Paul, do you want to turn, just, Paul, just check your microphone is on um, and you, you should be able to speak. We've got you up there. You can go ahead and ask your question, Paul. Make, make, make your comments. Um, I, I just wondered, um, you know, I, I dealt with people who were tortured and interrogated often for long periods, with long periods in confinement, um, solitary confinement. And there were two things that struck me about how resilient or more resilient some of them were. And the, the first was establishment of a routine, whatever it was, even in a small cell, was a very important uh, survival mechanism. Um, apart from probably a health mechanism as well. And the other was that those who had a fixed ideation or goal or beacon for which they wanted to live for, uh, whether it was a wife or an ideal or something, they coped far better with both the interrogation and the, uh, and the incarceration. And I just wondered, I, I don't know if you were tortured in any way, but I'm sure your life was uncertain. And that in itself is a tor torture. Great, that, thank you very much, Paul. I'm going to take at the same time, because it falls off, off, off the back of this, I'm going to take a question from Jim Lernstein so that we can deal with both of those questions. Uh, and then both John and Judith can give, um, give their thoughts. Jim, J Jim, you're up now. If you can un make sure you're, there you go. Jim, go ahead and ask your question. Uh, yes, my question is, if there is a second wave in six months, and a serious second wave, uh, and, and the consequence would be an, an extended lockdown for a second time, how will people react? Will they be, will it be easier for them or more difficult? I think it's a really good question, um, that, that one there. So first of all, Judith, on, on the, both Judith and John, on the question of routine and how that helps. Judith. So that's a really great question. And it's a really, I think it takes us to something very practical. And John, I'd be really interested whether this was something you did. But we know, as we were talking about that locus of control, one of the first things that you can do to internalise control is to say, well, what can I do with my time for the next hour? And if, I, if, I, if someone's having a panic attack, I'll just bring them back into it. What would you like to do in the next hour? And it's that very basic, just take some control over what you're doing, even if it's what you're doing with your thoughts and your body for the next hour, and then expanding that into a routine. And it does make us feel that we're in control. And the other piece about this, this greater thing outside, the people who, who did better, who were tortured and who had connection to something beyond their immediate circumstances, well, again, we know that that, it's a predictor of good outcome from people who come out of prison. It's a predict predictor of good outcome for people who go through addiction programs. This idea of being connected to something either bigger than yourself or beyond yourself or external, that it's almost like in, in AA, they talk about the higher power, but it is very much, it carries you through. And with my clients, I just talk about context and perspective, which is you're in this now, context and perspective will take you beyond it, even yeah. mentally. John, you t um, take that question, and then we'll come to the question of the, a possible second lockdown. So, John, on, on routine structure and also yeah. goals. Well, thanks for the question, Paul. Yeah, uh, I think I would echo only what um, uh, uh, Judith has said very coherently already, eloquently already. And I think, you know, I remember being, you know, being in little cells and the idea of being able to make that space somehow one's own, even, even though it was just basically a mattress with a blanket on it and sometimes a basket with you know a spare pair of shorts and, and t-shirt and that was that was really important to feel that that was your space and that you could count 
on the daily routine that the guards would come in at some you know seven o'clock in the morning or whatever with 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 bread and jam or whatever it might be for breakfast and if you're lucky a cup of tea and then and then there would be the bathroom run as we call it and that sort of routine would go out through the day and go on throughout the day obviously uh, and then night time suddenly you knew you were locked in for the evening and that was it God willing, that was it. The, the, the threat, the fear was that the routine would be broken by a, a move to another prison or, or uh, when we weren't routinely tortured at all. We were, oh, sorry, that's bloody Amazon. You won't no, believe this, guys. I'm really sorry. Can I, ha, yeah, can, no, you can do with question this, number two? I sorry, this is this. routine and Amazon are here. Yeah. Oh. John has been waiting for three days. He has not gone out of his house for three days, not due to the virus but because he's been waiting for, um, for the Amazon delivery person to deliver uh, a Kindle, a Kindle so he can read the <coughs> book. I spoke to him two days about this and he says, I'm waiting for this Kindle to arrive. So it's a, a great timing. Judith, g g give your thoughts about a second, a second lockdown and the possibility okay. of that. Yes, I mean, poor John, we were talking about hypervigilance to external things happening and then this happens, the Amazon delivery arrives. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the second wave is a really, it's a really good question. And I, I think, again, there's a piece around getting some control over that and going, we probably need to prepare for a second wave. But I think if we can prepare for a second wave in a positive mindset and go, we come to a second wave in a totally different place from how we came to the first wave. Because if there's a second wave, we now know a lot more about the virus. It's less new. We have slightly less uncertainty. We've got more of a sense of many, many things, everything from how to treat it to how to reduce transmission. So we come to a second wave if it comes in a very different place. And we also come to a second wave, hopefully with a sense of how we coped last time in lockdown and what was good and what was bad. So we kind of, if we think of it as having built up our resilience to this already, then we come to, you know, this may happen again and that's okay because we dealt with it last time and we survived and here we all are. So I think a mindset piece is worthwhile sort of bringing into play. Yeah. Jim, um, I, I want to come back to you, Jim Lernstein, because um, I'm interested um, if how, how you would embrace the idea of a, a second lockdown. And also, um, I think it's fair to say you, you <coughs> are, uh, we know you well and you are um, our most senior customer. Okay. And you, you've never experienced anything like this in your lifetime. And maybe you want to say something about that, too, if you if if you allow me to. Well, no, I haven't experienced anything like this in my lifetime. Uh, so and when, can you say when you were born? Pardon me? Can you say when you were born, which when I'm being very unfair on you, when were you yes, born? Yes, I was born in 1927. Uh, but... Uh, during the during the during World War II, I was in boarding school. Hence, it didn't affect me. Uh, when I started in the foreign service, I started in Paris. I was alone in Sarajevo for six months, all by myself. And that as was the only the Marshall program just after the war, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I was the only foreigner in Bosnia Herzegovina, uh, and I was not allowed to have any. Um, relationships at all. No one would speak to me. But I was out all day in a jeep with an interpreter. So during the day, uh, I did have human contact, but in the evenings I didn't. But th that really wasn't how, very how have you found? How have you found lockdown? I mean, you're living in, in, in Georgetown, and um, I presume you can get out and about, and you can walk out. How have you found it personally? Well, not that difficult. I mean, what, what, what I find difficult uh, is the whole question of what the world is going to look like after lockdown. Because when you think about the theater and movies and restaurants and travel and all of that, how, how long is this going to last? My theory is it'll last until there's a vaccine and that that, that, that vaccine is available to everyone, uh, at least in the Western world. And I, it seems to me that will probably be a couple of years. So at the end of that two years, what institutions will remain and what institutions will have disappeared? Yeah, I think it's a really good question. And I guess that's the, the sort of known, known unknown. Jim, thank you very much in, indeed for that. Um, I'm going to ask um, Sheila de Belague to ask her question as well. Sheila, your, your mic's open. Go ahead. Um, yeah, it's a question for, 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 for John. Um, 
uh, I mean, it's probably a question you've been asked lots of times. Did you record the passage of time when you were a prisoner? Were you able to? And if you did, was such a help or was it just depressing um, to find out how, time, how much time you had already spent? Um, and I sort of kept a diary during this lockdown and um, um, it's, I think it's been, it's been quite helpful um, to be able to, but then of course we did have some idea of when it was all going to stop, which, or when likely to stop, whereas you had no idea. So perhaps recording the passage of time is not a help. Thank you, Sheila. It's a, it's a very good question. Uh, yes, it was really important uh, for me, at least, uh, and I think for some of the other guys, to, to keep a, a record of the passage of time. I remember in solitary confinement, thinking of Paul's question earlier about, about routine, I remember in solitary confinement, every time I came back from being taken to the bathroom uh, once a day in this underground prison, scratching a mark on the wall, you know, and making five, you know, four marks and crossing it for five days, just to keep a track of what day it was and what, what, what day it was in the outside world. But no idea really of, of the time of day, because we're underground, so no daylight, but just that sense of trying to keep track. And now that became much easier uh, when I was uh, then with, with, with Brian Keenan and other hostages that we could keep track of the day. And sometimes, you know, we, we, you know, we, we, we would check with the guards even perhaps what time it was, just, just, just for the sake of it. So that, and the, but it was important. It was really, uh, um, on the one hand, it, as you suggested, Sheila, it was dispiriting that you would look back and think, God, that's another month gone, that's another month gone, and another month gone, that's a year gone, and whatever. But it was still important to feel that's it, and also to try and remember, okay, it's my mum's birthday today, or whatever it might be, just that, that, that sense of, of, of connection with the real world. And basically, we just did that. And I also used it in a bizarre way, in a mad way, of trying to work out, you know, we were, say, I would record, try and remember how many days we were in that prison, then when we were moving, how, how many months we were in that place. And I'd try and co concoct these ridiculous calculations by which I could then predict in, in this world of total unpredictability and uncertainty, right, now that's when we will be released. It'll be, you know, April the 3rd. And if April the 3rd was a, just a couple of months away, that was something I could hang on for. And it was totally mad, obviously, but it was a, a weird kind of psychological game I played with myself. It drove particularly Brian Keenan mad. He got really annoyed with it. But I used to predict these days, and bizarrely, I did predict exactly the day he was released, except it was me that was meant to go home, and he went home a year before me. But it was important to keep a sense of time. And I think, you know, it's, it's right. You know, that, 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 that we need to have our, our lives sort of, you know, do evolve around time. I don't know why that is exactly. Obviously, it's sort of on practical levels. But that one was was a more emotional and, and spiritual level of just being in touch with the real world that was spinning, you know, regardless of the control that these people had immediately over me and Brian and the other hostages, that beyond them was the world that they could, you know, they couldn't control and that continued happily, you know, outside the cells that we were in. Right. Um, let, let's bring up Barbara Clark, because I think her question um, is, um, follows up very nicely uh, on the question of time, which is another aspect, which is really um, in a question of, of touch, physicality. So, Barbara, go, go ahead and ask your question. Yes, it's, it's more a point that I just welcome your comments on, really. Um, um, physical touch is a basic need and we all remember for example the Romanian orphans who'd never been touched and have suffered real stunting of their emotional growth and everything and physical growth. Um, people who live alone like myself um, I haven't been touched for over 12 weeks and I'm fine at one level but as this goes forward, I'm kind of think, wondering, I don't know, what's that like? What's, what's, it's quite serious. And, and nobody seems to be talking about it. Yeah. I, I'm, gonna, I'm going to come, um, John, speak very briefly, because you, you were lucky to be with Brian and you had that tremendously close relationship. What, were there others who are locked up who do, who do, who, I mean, um, Terry Waite was in isolation for a very long period of time. Were there others who didn't have that companionship? 
Because Terry Waite was four years in solitary confinement on his own, and I think Barbara's absolutely right that that need for a hug. I remember when I saw a video of my mum who tragically died while I was still locked up, so I didn't say farewell to her, but she was appealing for our release early on, and they had a video of it. And I remember just you know being brown and being able to hug hug me afterwards when we were back in our cells and I was sobbing was was, was a vital resource. And I think that I can only you know feel for you now, Barbara, that you that you haven't had that touch, and also the fact that as as, as Judith was touching on earlier. When we are allowed to move out more, there's there going to be this sort of kind of tentative element of people. Do I actually want to hug her, or will, will will you want to hug them? And I think that that is that is something that we need need to deal with. And perhaps what well, Judith and her colleagues can help prepare us in a sense for you know re-entry in 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 that regard, because it will be something that we, we will really need because it's odd and not good not to have it. And most of us are lucky enough to have it often not to have that uh, and then to re re-establish that, that that literal physical con contact is going to be going to be really important in the, in the in, uh, well, coming months and hopefully that we won't go into another lockdown yeah yeah and judith if i can chip in i mean i, I think seeing some of these demonstrations but also raves secret raves taking place in the uk in manchester for example uh, some of this anxiety and tension that's been built up by lockdown sort of spilling out literally uh, on onto the street um, maybe I don't know if you interpret it that way, but what, what's your what's your thoughts about this? And uh, as as we've been through twelve weeks of um, you know, restrained human relations, I think it's a bit like the sort of connective tissue of society has been dissolved. So there's you know there's all the bits that you can really see uh, the economy, people going to work, people being fed. So we're all basically okay. We're we you know we're dry and we're fed and we're watered, but we're not actually okay because there's all this stuff that you don't see until it dissolves. And your point, Barbara, about touch is so crucial. So that you, we know that uh, human babies don't survive. I worked in a Romanian orphanage back in 1992 and did a lot of touching. My whole job was to take, to pick the children up and clean them. That's what I did. Um, and touch is crucial. I've got a colleague who is a craniosacral practitioner and she's so suffering because she's living alone. And she's also not touching her clients. So she's missing out on that. So I think, you know, from a practical perspective, find a friend who's also living alone and make sure that you get to hold hands occasionally or shake hands or give each other a hug. Because if she's, if you've got a friend who's very isolated, and not at high risk, then touching her is probably a safe, or him is probably a safe thing to do. Yeah. So that, th thank you very much, Barbara, for sharing your thoughts and feelings. That was some, that was, thank you very much. Very brave of you as well. Um, please, can we can we um, bring up Richard, Richard Murphy? Richard, your microphone should be open now. If you can, there we go. There we go. Okay. Yeah. No, it's just um, for Dr. Judith. Really, any thoughts about in the particular position of young people? I'm speaking as a father of a 20 year old and a 22 year old um, because it's been very odd for them. And certainly, my 22 year old had four weeks on her own in a house because all her friends went home, but she stayed in their college house. But on the other side, last night, I did watch her and her friends for two hours playing Fortnite. So running around shooting things, but actually very much on headphones, talking to one another, acting as a team in a virtual world. So there's a real, they have a very different experience. Uh, thank you, Richard, for, for bringing that up, because I think there's a very interesting point here to be made. Jim Lowenstein earlier on said, you know, that lockdown hadn't been too bad. Um, and his gentleman in his 90s. And I think for, for older adults, there's been the anxiety that, oh my goodness, COVID's a death sentence. Well, fortunately it, it, it isn't, but it's more serious. For the younger people, there's been a completely different thing, which is COVID has just taken away all of their ability to go into the world and make their lives. Now, those of us in our 40s and above have got hopefully got houses and relationships and we've got all of these relationships in our head. So even if we're isolated, we know so many people we can connect with, it's all there. If you're in your 1920s, you know, your mid 20s, you're trying to go out and make these connections and establish them and embed them. And that's, you know, been taken away in the real world. But of course, the strength of that generation is their connection through the virtual world. So it's a very, they're going to have a very different experience of the world full stop, I think, because of the internet. But this is certainly pointing things towards the, the virtual world, I think. We've got time for some more questions. So please do um, uh, just, if you haven't asked one yet, please do jot one down in the Q and A section just there. Um, John, I, I was very interested in something that um, you said in an interview a, a few years back, and it was about coming to terms with your identity, coming to terms with how 
um, what had happened to you, it shaped your life. And people do refer to you as John McCarthy, the Lebanese hostage, um, which, you know, at one level must have been bloody annoying because, you know, you're more than that. But eventually you came to you came to accept it. Can you just talk a bit about that? <laughs> Quite right. It was it was I remember talking to Brian about it once. So it might have been Ann, Terry Anderson or, or indeed Terry Waite. And it was this thing that it was always whichever was, was introduced for a radio or TV interview, whatever it might be, it was followed by what we called ourselves FBH club, you know, former Beirut hostage. And it, and it was sort of, oh God. And I remember arguing, I did a, I had a lovely job doing a TV series, traveling around Britain on a sailing boat with, with an old friend of mine, Sandy Toxley, years ago. And it was brilliant. And, uh, and, but the producer said, Johnny, you don't have to worry. You've got it made. You, you know, you've got your, you know, your, your, your special, uh, your special thing, your, your unique, whatever it is, thing, uh, ISP. And, and I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, you've got the former Beirut hostage. And I said, I don't want that. That means I'm sort of renowned, famous for for sitting on my bum for, for five years and not being able, not making any decisions. It's not like I've written a brilliant thing or done some wonderful medical treatment or invented something or what it or become a footballer. He said, "No, but you've got it." But years later, I sort of thought, "Hmm, maybe he was right." You know that, you know, it was something that I think, and because I was so lucky coming out of that experience, being given the opportunity to write about it, uh, I wrote a book with my my then fiance uh, who campaigned for us, Jill Morell. Uh, about the campaign and the captive experiences, uh, you know, from from different uh, separate points of view, of course, over the five years, and that was that was really important and cathartic in its own right. But also the respect that we we, we were given, uh, all the hostages and, and, and people like Jill too, of course, was was, was important and kind of um, validated the really difficult times that we had been through, obviously, and that and that was good. And, and in a way, you know, the fact that you kindly invited me to join you and Judith today and and and, and your and your friends. You know that, that 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 continues. So that so I think that's something that certainly let me think that the FBH you know, tag isn't so bad after all. And and it's still you know it it might be there, but it's, it's not annoying. I just realise that it's something. Yeah, that's that's probably what I am best known for. Even though I have hopefully made a few radio and TV programs, etc., etc., uh, alongside that. Yeah. So there's a, an element of you know you're trying to embrace and accept something which is horrendous. I mean I'm. And I took, use an extreme example. If you if someone had survived the Holocaust, how would they embrace that? Judith, it's it's a difficult one, and, and again, it's an unfair comparison. But um, as we emerge from this, this might go on for two years. This could go on for a very very long period of time. Um, how, psychologically, uh, should you embrace it? Should you be fighting against it? How are we meant to deal with it? Great, great question. I mean, yeah, the fighting against it is um, is something that I've been thinking about because it's very tempting at times to get really furious and kind of rage against it and go, ah, this is awful. I want things to go back to normal. But we know with change, the key to changing is is just embracing it and going, it's not what I wanted, but I've got to get used to it. And I think, John, actually your story is so powerful because, uh, and the, you know, the reason that you've sort of flourished and been so successful is that we those of us who haven't been through something so horrendous see you have, as having come through it and having thrived the other side. And that's certainly a story of hope. And that's something, it's a nice thing to, for other people to see and to go, gosh, imagine to go through that and to come out the other side and to thrive. And that's very powerful, I think. And so, so maybe that's what we all have to do is to say, yes, there's so many aspects of this which are awful. So many, you know, the worry for the economy, the worry, I worry about the impact on low income households, I worry about the impact on low income children, what's going on in high rise flats where there's very little resource. It's a, it's a horrendous situation. And so where we can create the positive, where we can grow new things, where we can develop new ideas, um, all of those things, I think, can be very, can be very positive. But yeah, we, we can't rage against it. We've got to kind of be adaptable and, and, and change where we can, really, I think. Yeah, um, I agree with you. I think it's really important that, and, and it also that comes back to resilience. I mean, most of us, the human instinct is to survive and try and keep going, and also often to carry up those around us to, onwards. And I, I, I was just thinking back to what you were saying about, uh, you know, hopefully looking to to the future and being worried about that, but at the same time looking forward to maybe making, you know, with thinking of you know, no airplanes in the sky and. Heathrow to a better to a, to a brighter world in, in many ways, whether that's on issues of racism or, or, or climate change, etc. And, and what Paul asked us earlier about, you know, did, was there something that kept kept particularly kept me going? And I think yes, I had the very basic human thing of thinking I was a 
young woman I was engaged to marry and I was looking forward to that, but also the background of my family and the love I had for them and they for me, those things all kept one going. And I think if one can focus on that and think, yes, life is bloody bad at the moment. However, I've still got family and friends that I care for and I know they care for me, even if we can only meet in this weird world of Zoom. That's fantastic and that will continue. And also, yes, I want to get back to seeing them again, but maybe the world will change and to looking, if one can, to, to a brighter horizon rather than assuming it will be that, which is easy to say, uh, I know, but it's essentially, I think what you've been saying in a way, rather than sort of concentrating on the negatives, try and look for some of the, some of the positives and assume that there will be more, or hope that there'll be more positives coming. Well, that's a very, um, I think a positive, a great note to end on. Um, my thanks to you both. It's been a, a tremendous discussion. The questions have been really good. Um, and I've, you know, personally benefited from it as well. So and I think everybody has. So my thanks very much indeed to John McCarthy and to Judith Murring for, for their help.